Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here and talk about a part of my research. I work on control theory, power system, and optimization theory. And today, my talk is mostly about optimization theory. And I'm going to talk about applications on power and a little bit of control, not much. But these are all related because I'm going to talk about the foundations of mathematics that can be applied to multiple areas. And this is joint work with my research group, a former student, Ramtin Madani, who is now assistant professor at Texas Arlington, another former student, Abdurrahman Kalbat, who is now assistant professor in Dubai, my colleague, Alfred M. Turk at UC Berkeley, and another colleague of mine, Ross Ballig at UT Austin. So this talk is about polynomial optimization. And by polynomial optimization, I mean the minimization of a polynomial objective function subject to an arbitrary number of polynomial constraints. And I have a variable x, which is a vector, and which could be real valued or complex valued. So this talk is mostly about solving this problem. And we know that polynomial optimization includes combinatorial optimization. Like if I want to say x is 0 or 1 or minus 1 or plus 1, I just say x is squared equal to 1. And since integer programming or discrete optimization is really hard to solve in the worst case, we expect polynomial optimization to be hard. And we know that once we deal with an optimization problem, there are different types of solutions. Like if I have a surface and I'm looking for a solution to minimize some objective, I can look for a solution that is locally the best strategy, a local minimum, a solution that is globally the best strategy, the lowest value possible. And finding local solution is easy. That's what we've been doing for centuries. All kind of like descending algorithm would end up with a local solution. But finding a global solution is a big challenge. That's about MP completeness. But the question is, what if we try to find a near global solution? A solution that is not the best one possible, but it's kind of good, and we can quantify how far away we are from the best one. So this talk is about finding a global or a near global solution. And once we talk about near global solution, since it's not the best one possible, we have to come up with an optimality guarantee which is a number between 0% and 100%, which tells us how far we are away from the optimal one in the worst case. So the focus of the talk is on finding a near globally optimal minimum with a high optimality guarantee that is hopefully close to 100%. And we're going to address two problems. The first one is convexification. This is a hard problem in the worst case. What if I come up with a convex model whose solution or whose unique solution is near global for this problem. So I want to map point C to a, to a solution of a convex problem, and then I solve an easy problem. It's kind of a relaxation, and then I'm done. But most probably, that convex problem is really high dimensional. Although it's easy to solve theoretically, it's really hard to solve practically because we are going from some lower dimensional space to a very high dimensional space. Then we need some customized numerical algorithm. So the second part of the talk is about how to design new algorithms. And we're going to use ideas and techniques in different areas and also develop techniques in different areas. Areas like low rank optimization, matrix completion, graph theory, and different convexification techniques. And before talking about this really dry abstract problem, let's motivate it and see why we care about optimization at this scale. Energy is becoming important and probably like a while ago, like 10 years ago, we realized that energy is really important. There are new challenges that didn't exist like 20 years ago. And if I want to give you a one minute presentation of the import and the importance of energy, I should say that like a power system has different layers the top layer is called generation, where we have a lot of sources of energy. The middle layer is called transmission, when we serve, where we like send power around between different cities. And the last one is called distribution, where we distribute power within each neighborhood. But the middle part is the heart of the system. That's where we do all the control and optimization. And there are, lots, there are different important companies, like ISOs or independent system operators, that deal with the control of a system from this point, or at this point. And there are different fascinating optimization problems that we need to solve on a regular basis. The first one is optimal power flow OPF. 
The second one is security constraint, LPF, state estimation, network configuration, unit commitment, dynamic energy management. So we realize that if we take it for granted that like getting electricity is easy, but there are so many optimization problems that we need to solve every five minutes to make it work. Because this is a system where we need to match millions of consumers with thousands of producers. But the interesting part for a researcher like me is that these problems are really hard to solve. They're and strongly and complete for both real-time operation, electricity market, and let's see why we care about it. Let's focus on the first one. All these problems are built upon laws of physics that are called like power flow equation. So let's focus on the first one, okay? I don't have it here. Yeah. So I get, I get to this later. So at this point, the basic idea is that we have a bunch of optimization problems and the question is how can we solve it. At some point during my talk, I'm going to focus on the first one. It turns out that most of these problems can be written as a quadratically constrained quadratic optimization. We have a quadratic objective and a bunch of quadratic constraints. And it turns out that every polynomial optimization can be written like that. If I have like x to the 4, I can write it as x squared squared, and x squared is a new variable like y, and then I can break down all the exponents and make it quadratic. So almost all optimization problem can be approximated by polynomial optimization problem, and polynomial optimization problem is equivalent to quadratic optimization. But we know linear program is easy, so that means that Com computational complexity is just about having quadratic equation. So how can I deal with quadratic equation? Maybe I can use a trick here. I write x transpose mx as a trace of mx x transpose. I replace x x transpose with a matrix w. Now quadratic terms in terms of the vector x are linear in terms of the matrix w. Now we can declare vector saying that we linearize this in terms of w with respect to a new variable w, but there is a caveat. This w is positive semi-definite, and it's rank 1. If I drop the rank constraint, this would be the semi-definite programming relaxation, or SDP relaxation, which was popularized in around 1995, and people applied to many, many areas. So if this SDP relaxation has a rank 1 solution, I can map it back to a global solution of the original problem. But what if it's not rank 1? We propose to penalize the objective by a new function that I'm going to talk about it and adding some extra inequalities that are called valid inequalities to enforce the solution to be rank 1. And if we get a rank 1 solution for penalized SDP, maybe we can map it back to a near global solution of the original problem. So that's the high level strategy for abstract polynomial optimization problems. And we're going to apply it to power. And for those of you who are familiar with some of the squares and other techniques, they talk about semi-definite like SDP relaxation, but they increase the size through moments. But we keep the size the same. That's really important for us, because we're going to talk about problems with billions of variables at the end of this talk. That's the scale of problem that we care about in the energy domain. So this is the idea. So we tried it on power a while ago, and then we realized that, OK, STP is not supposed to be exact in general, but STP is exact for IEEE benchmark example for several real data sets. And that was fascinating for us, because this problem was introduced in 1962. There are so many research papers on this. And this was the first idea that was proposed for finding a global solution. So maybe like ISOs are solving the same problem, getting the same solution, but they never know that's global. Now this SDP would give us a certificate of global optimality. And then we were able to prove that since distribution networks are acyclic, as long as the price of electricity, that is called LMP, is non-negative, SDP works. And for transmission network, as long as the price of electricity is not negative and we have transformers, then SDP works. In other words, we showed that the physics of power network reduces the computational complexity. This is a hard problem, but it's not the hardest problem ever. People talk about SDPs, but this is a very fascinating SDP in the sense that the coefficients come from a physical system. Maybe we can exploit it and get some properties out of this. And then we said, okay, price of electricity, for those of you who do energy 
would realize that the price of electricity is not always non-negative. Sometimes you are paid to consume power so that you can satisfy laws of physics. So practically speaking, you would say if I want to get some resources, I have to pay for it. But since you're all constrained by a network, sometimes you're paid to withdraw power so that laws of physics is satisfied. So about like 5% of prices may not be positive. Then STP may not work. So we got the data for like larger scale systems like European grid. STP didn't work, so we came up with penalized STP, tried it on different systems like Polish grid. For each one, which is a very large scale problem, we found a solution that is feasible and global optimality guarantee was at least 99%. And that means maybe you can spend days to find the truly globally optimal solution but using this SDP or penalized SDP idea, you found the solution is feasible, and you would say if there is a better solution, that's better by Epsilon. I can guarantee that. And SDP looks really promising for energy application, and many, many colleagues in, in, in academia and industry started working on this. There were so many talks at Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on this. And we had lots of discussion with different companies and the government. And recently, RPIE, which is a big part of the Department of Energy, has is setting up a competition, which is a cash price competition. And total cash prices are over like 3.5 million for the best algorithm for OPF. So now they came to the conclusion that this is a really important fundamental problem for the operation. And there are recent studies by different companies like Net. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which says the way that we operate system in practice, because the problem on large scale, we have to do the approximation, and we are wasting billions of dollars on this. What if we come up with a competition, get people from industry, academia, and government together, get the hard, hardest, like, to, like benchmark examples, try to design the best algorithm for that, and that's the that's not a grant, there's a lot of cash prices, you can buy a house. So if you're interested in this, just search RPIE grid competition to get some information, to really understand the importance of like, optimization in the energy domain. So go back to the original story, we have a polynomial optimization. We said polynomial optimization can be converted to a quadratic optimization, and then we use SDP or penalized SDP. We're going to address a number of questions. And if you look at the title of my talk, I said energy or power system and distributed control. It turns out that many other problems, like control problem, can be written like this. Or maybe they're infinite dimensional, maybe they're the opposite of equation. It's very similar to this. And then we can use a similar idea. But there are fundamental questions that we need to answer at this point. The first question is, if I use this idea, what is the rank of W? In practice, we know that we have a sparsity. We have natural sparsity. Most of real world systems are sparse one way or another, depending on the representation. So if I know that these matrices are sparse, can I somehow upper bound the rank of W? If the rank is 1, it's great. If the rank is 2, it's, it's OK. I'm not happy with OK. But if the rank is N, maybe this idea fails completely. So we use ideas in graph theory, two notions that I'm going to talk about. One is OS and one is triwets to upper bound the rank of W. It turns out that the rank of W here is upper bounded by some parameters of a graph that captures the sparsity of this. Yes? W is the solution. The solution. And I'm going to make it more precise later. A solution. There are infinitely many solutions. Some of them are high rank, some of them are low rank. So the lowest rank solution has the bound on its rank. So that would be another challenge, because we have high rank and low rank solution at the same time. How can I distinguish? And the second one is that once I know that for sports problems, I have a low rank solution W, how can I make it rank 1? How can I design the penalty term? And we're going to propose two different techniques to design penalty. And for those of you who do like conference sensing, it's a generalization of that idea. That how can we go from low rank to rank 1? Well, there are lots of fascinating ideas around it, but not for polynomial optimization, but in statistics, in machine learning. We're going to talk about some of those ideas here. Another one is that I'm going from n variable to n squared variables, curse of dimensionality. You would say n squared is polynomial time, but still you're going from f this is 1 million. Just imagine 1 million is squared. How can you solve it? 
Then you cannot use gradient, Newton's, interior point method to just break down very quickly. You realize that, for example, if you do simulation, you realize that if x has like 10,000 variables and you want to solve this using the state of the art SDP solvers, so do me Mosaic, this takes more than two years. Just count the number of flops. So suddenly you realize that you're going from one minute to two years because the complexity of solving this is n to the six. And then n is 10,000, just see how hard it is. So we came up with a new numerical algorithm based on ADMM or over relaxed ADMM. And we solved problems with billions of variables on Amazon servers. We're going to talk about it, the new algorithm for big data. All of them are in the same, under the same umbrella. I start from polynomial optimization. I go to a new model. Then I use a new numerical algorithm. And then I'm going to talk about some specific problem, like unit commitment is a canonical problem in operation research where we have discrete variables. In control theory, we mostly deal with continuous nonlinearity. How can I use this idea for discrete variable? That's another challenge. That's a decision. Should I go this way or that way? Should I use this or that? And what if you have so many constraints? How can I do pre-processing? -pre I get to that later. Then I talk about some distributed control problems. So let's see how far I can go. I'm just going to give you ideas about these things. The first one, what's the connection between a sparsity of the original problem and the rank of W? Let's just start with that. There are two notions in graph theory. One was around for about four decades. One was introduced less than 10 years ago. And those notions, when they started, they started in the graph community. It had nothing to do with the rank. But we were able to connect the dots and see if we can use those notions to answer the question for low rank optimization. The first one is OS, or ordering set. What is OS? Given a graph, so it takes some time to digest these properties. I just give you the flavor of this because the technical definition is a little crazy. The basic idea is that I have a graph, I pick vertices and order them in a way that some properties, weird properties are satisfied. And the maximum number of vertices that I can pick, one at a time, so that this is connected to this, not connected to that, some properties are satisfied. That sequence, the size of that is called OS. So OS is about how many vertices can I pick? This, then this, then this, then that, so that if I order them, some properties are satisfied. So that is about OS. So this is a new notion, but some notion that people know for a long time in the discrete optimization community is 3D composition. And one motivation for them was the following. Many, many discrete optimization problems are MP hard. How can I draw the boundary between easy problem and hard problem? They came up with the notion of 3D composition and they concluded that MP hard problem get easy as long as this parameter is bounded. So 3D composition is a number which tells us when hard problems are not the worst case scenario, they get easy. And the idea is the following. I have a graph that may not be a tree. How can I make a tree out of this? I go from vertices to super vertices. They're called bags. So I do clustering to make a tree out of this. Again, I have to satisfy a strange properties. Like if a vertex A appears multiple times, it should be a connected subgraph and some other properties. But the basic idea is that I start with the graph do clustering over vertices, go from nodes or vertices to bags, make a tree out of this, satisfy this, then each bag has a size, try to make them as small as possible. The tree width is the minimum width that you get. So why do we care about these two notions? In graph community, they've shown that for very sparse graph, tree width is really a small, OS is really large. So these two notions in graph theory quantify a sparsity. So if I have a graph, how can I say it's a sparse or not? There are many ways. If from a naive perspective, I would say I count the number of edges, I count the number of vertices. But maybe that doesn't talk about the underlying computational complexity. Like the tree base of a tree is one. If this was tree at the beginning, the tree base is one. If this was a single cycle, the tree base was two. If this is a fully connected graph, the tree is n. What is OS? Tree is really small, OS is really large. OS of a tree is n minus 1. OS of a cycle is n minus 2. So there are two notions at this point. Any question? Okay, good. 
So we have started with this problem. These are sparse. How can I capture the sparsity? I get the support of this, support of this, put them together. I make a graph that I have out of this. We call it a sparsity graph. So a sparsity graph has n vertices. Whenever I have an edge, that means x i x j is an important monomial. It shows up somewhere. Whenever we don't have an edge, like between x1 and x4, that means x1 and x4 doesn't exist in this optimization. So the vertices of the sparsity graph are about the parameters. The edges are about the non-zero coefficients that capture a sparsity. And this is SDP. might have low rank solution, high rank solution. I skip this part. It turns out that the rank of SDP is upper bounded by OS. To simplify the idea, OS of some, this graph, or something that we call super graph, OS of this is about the rank. So this theorem says, let me just continue this and get back to this later. And OS of this is upper bounded by three bits. So basically, if I want to summarize and be very precise here, is that give me an arbitrary polynomial optimization in what, whatever domain that you care about. I can equivalently convert it to a quadratic to constraint quadratic optimization. You say number of variables? Oh. The number of variables grows. Yeah, but in a polynomial way. In a polynomial way. That's really important. So if I have x to the 4, I have to define a new variable y, say, x to the 4 is y squared, subject to an additional constraint that x is squared equal to y. So we increase the number of variables, the number of constraints, but in a log way. It can show that it's a log way in terms of the highest degree. That's an important point. Then we solve SDP. SDP has a surface of solution, or face of solution. This is the highest rank, this edge. The, if I talk about this edge, the rank reduces by 1. If I talk about this corner, the rank reduces by 2. It turns out that for a sparse problem, most of the time, there are infinitely many solutions. That's where the notion of matrix completion comes into play. But the lowest rank solution has the rank upper bounded by three bits of the sparsity graph plus 1. So we can theoretically prove that. Our three bits just doesn't upper bound. If you look for a better upper bound, it's OS. But OS is really hard to calculate. And keep in mind that OS and tree vests are empty hard to calculate. If I give you a graph and say, what's the OS? It's hard. But I know that if the OS is big or if the tree vest is small, I have a low rank solution. So that's the good news. So let's go back to the power domain and see how we can make use of this. Yes? The formula seems to say it's minus OS. Oh, I didn't talk about this part. You're talking about this? Theorem. Oh, the theorem here. Minus in front of OS. Oh, here, right? Yeah. Oh, because this formula is about OS. Okay, if you look at this, okay, let's, it's a good point. I just went through this quickly because there's another concept that I want, don't want to explain. That takes some time. But if you look at this, three bits is, for example, one. OS is n minus one. So n minus OS is kind of three bits, not exactly the same. So this is like n. And this is like OS, so the difference is 3 bits. So that's why we have a minus, because OS is a big number. And this is the number of vertices minus that big number goes down, and it's related to 3 bits. By this one? Yeah. So something big number minus another big number, and then you will say this. Yeah, that's a good point. But this is really hard to calculate. Another upper bound is 3 bits. Yes? This is for every arbitrary polynomial optimization. As long as you have minimization of a polynomial objective, subject to an arbitrary number of polynomial constraints, then you have a bound like this. I think yeah. the question was that you said that the rank was bounded by OS. Even though that's not what the formula says, maybe it was yeah. the bound is bound. The rank is bounded by a formula that depends on a OS. Okay. Right. A formula that depends on OS. Yeah, not exactly OS. Yeah, that's very important. A formula n minus OS, roughly speaking. Be a bad bound. Yeah, but it's not exactly OS. We have to take a minimum of OS of subgraphs. You know, it's more involved. Yeah. The larger OS, the better. Right? The largest OS, the better. The way you said it, it sounded like that. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, sorry. The larger the OS, the better. So let's 
Do one example in power, see what that means. This is a system in Midwest, I guess probably around Wisconsin. This is a power network. When I look at it from a graph perspective, these are lines. And you would say the tree width of a tree is one. Take it for granted that the tree width of a tree is one. What is the tree width of this? There are so many cycles in here. But the tree width is just two. So from the computational, comple computational complexities perspective, this is away from a tree network just by number one. Because if I do clustering, suddenly this looks like a tree and these clusters are all very small. The tree width of I tree plus 300 bus system, this is another realistic system in the US, is six. The tree width of Polish grad is 25. The tree width of a big part of European grad with 13,000 nodes is just 27. So we have a system, it's a realistic system, man-made system, but that cannot be too complex because that's how the system evolves. They don't connect New York to Los Angeles through a direct line. We know that there is some underlying sparsity and that sparsity shows up here. That if we do clustering, all clusters are really small. Now, the good news is the tree of New York data, we got the data for New York State. New York State is very dense compared to other like grads because we understand like in place like Manhattan there is a lot of complexity in the network but it's still 40, it's a small number. So that means no matter what kind of optimization I solve for power, security constraint meaning that I try to make sure that the system is secure, if there is a fault, unit commitment which means we have discrete variables, should I use this generator or that generator. OPF, which is about laws of physics. If I just threw all of them in and solve a gigantic problem, it turns out that the size of W is more than a million. We have more than a million eigenvalues, but at most 40 of them are non-zero. Just because of the topology, a sparsity means a lot. It turns out that for distributed control problem, this number is three. When we have a Markov chain system, it turns out that the rank of, if we have distributed, for those of you who do optimal controls, you know, we use Riccati equation. If you do distributed control, it gets hard. Use SDP relaxation. What is the rank of that? The rank is upper bounded by three. It's one, two, three. Just because of having a Markov chain property that this, if I know the state now, I know I have a decoupling between past and the future, something like this. But here, the first message is that the rank is small for real world systems. How can I make it one? The small is not the same as one. Even going from two to one might be MP hard. So the second thing is, I know if this is smart, this is low rank, but low rank doesn't help. It's good, it's good news, but it's not one. How can I make it one? Maybe I can design a penalty or add extra constraints, something like this. So let's go by this sparse as possible. If this is diagonal, this is diagonal, means the graph has no edges. It turns out that you can convert, like change x squared to y, this is LP. So if there is no edge in the sparsity graph, the problem is trivial. So from a different perspective, that means edges in the sparsity graph make polynomial optimization MP hard. Just because of the coupling between variables, the problem is hard. If there is no coupling, then you can define new variables, make it LP. So whenever I solve this problem, and SDP is not low rank, we know we can say SDP failed. Why? One reason, or we can put it this way, STP failed because of the edges. Maybe we can localize non-convexity by saying this edge, which means the coupling between two variables, made STP fail, now do something about it. Then we find a near global solution. So how, whenever STP fails, we want to see what edges are problematic. We call them problematic edges or connection. For example, I would say, I had x9, x14 as a monomial somewhere in this problem. That was why SDP failed. How can I do this? This goes to, we build upon a very nice work by a Japanese mathematician that was published in 2001, and the idea is like this. I have a system, I have an optimization problem, I map it to a graph, a big matrix W should be positive semi-definite. And that very nice paper by a Japanese mathematician said the following. And it's related to matrix completion. I said, what if instead of this big node, but instead of all these nodes, I do clustering, consider the tree wets, then obtain sub matrices of this 
that are induced by super nodes. So let's see what that means. When this is positive definite, all submatrices are positive definite. This is positive definite, this is positive definite, and so on and so forth. But let's cherry pick submatrices. For example, in this Super node or bag, we have one, two, five. What if I get rag, row one, row two, row five, row column one, column two, column five, it's a submatrix. We know that whenever these are positive def, this is positive definite, all submatrices are positive definite. So the work of that guy says that if these submatrices are positive definite, these two are the same. You don't need to talk about all submatrices being positive definite. Just focus on select submatrices. And what we showed that on top of this was that even the rank of this matrix is exactly equal to the maximum rank of those submatrices. So that's another thing which is really important. So we're saying a big matrix positive definite focus on all submatrices. No, you don't need to focus on all submatrices. Some selections. And then it turns out that that also talks about rank. So if this is rank 1, all submatrices here are rank 1. If this is not rank 1, that means some submatrices here are not rank 1. So that's how we diagnose non-convexity. We would say, this is not rank 1, so I know one of them must be non-rank 1. I look at off-diagonal elements of that, and those are edges. So that's how, so whenever this is not rank 1, we call it problematic bag, problematic bag, and then I look at the edges are problematic edges, or monomials that are problematic. For example, if I do SDP on Polish grad, a system with 23,000, 2,300 nodes, SDP fails. I don't know why it fails. If I work through this, there are 11 lines in the sparsity graph that are problematic. So there are 11 relationships between the variables that are problematic. If I do something about it, I might be good. So at this point, I'm just localizing the problematic non-convexity. I don't know how to deal with this. So we did something in power. We said, what if, again, let's get back to the story for power. I have a network. I want to do resource allocation. And instead of that, for power, this is sparsity graph. This is really important. For power, this is sparsity graph overlaps with the physical graph. So this is a relationship between two variables I define. That's exactly the transmission line that I see on the street. So it turns out power area, this fictitious graph that I define as sparsity graph, is just a graph of a physical system. So whenever I say like 11 relationships are problematic, that means 11 physical lines of a system are problematic. Maybe those lines are bottlenecks. I have to do something about it. Look at them as communication lines. Maybe I should do something about it. So what if, yes? Is a unique way of identifying those problematic edges? If you, if you f so there is no unique way to get this tree wet, tree decomposition, but if you get the, fix the tree decomposition, there is a unique way to get that. Yeah, that's another thing that we can talk about. It's really important. We thought about it, but it's, it's a very delicate topic. It could happen that these two together make it non-convex and fail, or these two together. But if you identify one subset, you focus on it and try to do something about it. And we said, what if we change the objective of the problem, penalize something that is called reactive loss over problematic lines? So I solve SDP for a physical system, it fails. I would say this is bad. But what can I do? Instead of that big W, I focus on submatrix W, calculate the rank, get problematic bags, get problematic edges, and then we say, for those edges that are physical lines, I penalize reactive power. I'm changing the object to a problem, and for those of you who do market, that means I'm defining price for providing voltage support or for providing reactive power. Because price of electricity is about the actual work, which is active power. It would say if you define a price for reactive power, which is something fictitious, well, reactive power is some imaginary number. But maybe that helps. And then it turns out that for problems that are hard, there are three different solutions. SDP fails. But if we penalize the reactive power, we are going from low rank to rank one. And then there is a large range of penalty coefficients that the, the Value doesn't change, the objective value, and it's still it's going to work. So we tried it on 7,000 different 
systems. So this was our paper that got a big award like, if, like just two days ago from the Informed Society because it started with a very hard problem. We came up with an idea. We tried there are many, many systems. For example, there are systems where there are five different local solutions. SDP failed. SDP failed for most, almost all of them. But after doing reactive power polarization, we get solution that some of them are 100% globally optimal, but all of them are higher than 99% globally optimal. So if there's a better solution, that's better by epsilon. So by just trying to change the objective to account for bottlenecks in the system, that idea worked. But this is heuristic at this point. How can I formalize this? So I said reactive power. Where does it come from? What does it mean exactly? I need to design an objective where we have a function that is probably linear in W and some coefficient, and hopefully this is rank one. So that was the idea. And if you do comprehend sensing, you would say, okay, I consider a nuclear norm. Nuclear norm is just a convex envelope of rank over like some interval. Nuclear norm looks good. It turns out, no, this is great for comprehend sensing, for phase retrieval, for Problems like a structured problem like energy. For a structured problem with a sparsity, nuclear norm doesn't work because nuclear norm, if you read all the fascinating paper by Ben Rack, by Candace, by people who work in that society, they say that the problem should be probabilistic. These matrices should be probabilistic enough so that nuclear norm would give us a rank one solution. But in areas like distributed control, in energy, this Matrices are highly structured. That's why we have a low trivet. So nuclear norm is not an option for us. We tried it. It didn't work. But nuclear norm is, just, in this case, the trace of W. What if, instead of trace of W, I say trace of MW, that M is going to be designed by another optimization problem? So our strategy is to consider a penalty that is quadratic in X, but linear in W, and the coefficients are going to be designed using another optimization. So let's see how we can do this. What is the best choice for this penalty m? So when lambda is 0, that's the original problem, the rank is high. We expect that as penalty goes increases, the rank goes down. When penalty is infinity, then the rank should be 1. So that's one way of looking at the penalty. What is a good penalty? When there is no penalty, rank is high. As penalty increases, the rank goes down. When penalty is at the extreme infinity, the rank is 1. But when lambda is infinity, this part is not important. The minimization of penalty by itself over the feasible set should give us rank 1. So a good penalty is a penalty where when we minimize the penalty by itself over the feasible set, I get rank 1. So minimize the penalty over a feasible set. How can I design M to guarantee that this is rank 1? I do the following. Like for those of you who do like numerical algorithm, like gradient algorithm, Newton's method, we start with some a priori information. That's called initialization, optimization. Let's do the same thing. I would say, I don't know the solution to the original problem, but I have a guess. I call it X star. X star is a guess for my original problem. It might be very close to the solution. It might be really far. At this point, I don't care about it. But based on a guess or initialization that is given, I design an M. M is positive definite. M x star is in the knowledge space of M. And 0 is a single eigenvalue of M. There are infinitely many M satisfying this. Then it turns out that, yes. And then the bottom, the two things. I guess N should be M, right? Same as above. No, no, the, 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 the box there. The box here? I equal to 1 through. OK. I equal to 1 to, uh, to M, right? At M, that's right. Yeah, that's M. Second thing, so you did change the inequality to an inequality? Okay, so basic idea for this M doesn't change, but the next theorem that I'm going to talk about, it just has a very good catch here. The next theorem that I'm going to talk about, it just for equalities, but if it's inequality, it's the same idea, but the theorem would be more complicated. So the basic idea is that I need a penalty whose minimization over the feasible set should give us a rank 1 solution. If the feasible set is characterized by equality and inequality, this theorem is more complicated. The theorem that I'm going to talk about, which is really easy to understand, 
Just says, let's assume that the feasible set is characterized by one inequality constraint, that's a positive semi-definiteness condition, and the rest are equality. So that's a very good point. And the theorem is the following. For both of the equality and inequality cases, we start with the guess, M is similar to this. The theorem like, says like this. There is a region that we call a recovery region around the guess, with a non there is, and that has a non-zero volume. If the true solution is in that region, SDP would give us a rank 1 solution. If the true solution is outside of this region, SDP definitely give us a non-rank 1 solution. So we can explicitly characterize. When M is designed based on three properties here, when M is designed like this, then we can show that first, there is a region we just this, we try to define the boundary for the success and failure. If you are within this, we're good. If you're outside of this, it's not going to work. But now the question is, how big is this? There are infinitely many amps. There is another optimization that tries to maximize the volume of this. And what we can show is this theorem, that there is a finite number of penalized SDPs that they would cover the whole space. So that's really important. So 1M gives us a local recovery region. If the solution is there, I'm going to find it by 1M. If that didn't work, I have to try another one. For example, you use homotopy to generate new M's. But there is a finite number of them that would cover this. So there's a finite number of STPs. I tried this, it didn't work, try the second one. At the end of the day, one of them is going to work. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Any question here? So at the end of the day, it depends on how, how many of them you have, right? That's a very good point. So computational complexity, or MP hardness, is just about how many of those we have. And in power, we just start with one, reactive power, and it works in 7,000 simulation. So that kind of implies that energy problem may not be hard. So the number of those SDPs is the computational complexity, but in energy, just one. That was very, this M that I defined, like I said, minimize the reactive power. Reactive power satisfies these properties. One M I tried in 7,000 stimulation. It worked. That means maybe energy problems are not hard. Another very interesting problem is the state estimation. What if I have noise in the system? It turns out that if I have, an, if I have noise in the system, some coefficients are wrong. And this is a very practical scenario. It could be wrong because sensors are not working or in the electricity market, some people are manipulating the system to get money. If you're JP Morgan, JP Morgan or all those big banks, they try to manipulate the system so that they satisfy all the regulations of market and they still they make money out of this. If you look at all the settlements, you realize that there are so many legal things that these banks have done and made like a half a billion dollars without owning a generator without producing anything, but just playing with these coefficients. Of course, regulators try to come up with ideas to hedge that, but the idea for us is that what if these start is noise in the system, like a state estimation? I propose one term for non-convexity, another term I can propose for a state estimation. So this is now like a statistical method. One takes care of non-convexity that we talk about, another one talks about estimating noise, then it turns out that the rank would, most of the scenarios never ever won. But the projection of that on rank one matrices or the true solution is upper bounded by the power of noise and some properties. So when you crop the coefficients, you don't get rank one. You get a high rank solution, you project it on rank one matrices. The question is how far you're away. Can you upper bound that one? It turns out that yes, that is possible. That's a generalization of exact penalty method that we have in optimization. We went from vector optimization to a non-convex matrix optimization. That's possible. So, so far we talked and we applied to many, many systems. So far we talk about two ideas which are really important. A sparsity means through the notion of OS and tree OS, we have a low rank solution. We can localize non-convexity design M to make it rank one. But at the end of the day, I have to solve, I have to find a numerical algorithm. That numerical algorithm might be the bottleneck for SDP. If you solve, solve a square, you quickly realize that 
It's great on two examples. It never works on big systems because the size of as a SOC, that SDP grows. We don't increase the size, but it's still going from n variables to n squared is a challenge. So I talk about this really, really quickly, but the idea is important. First, keep in mind that SDP includes second order comp program, include quadratic program, include linear program. So whatever idea I come with, I come up with, it applies to other previous versions of this. So a matrix was positive definite. We said that very nice paper in 2001 by a Japanese mathematician said, OK, replace this big matrix by sub-matrices. OK. But that reduces the number of variables. Maybe I go from n squared back to the order of n. But I still have to deal with conic constraints. How can I deal with conic constraints? So we come up with a multi-agent formulation of this. I assign each sub-matrix to a node that could be a fictitious node, computing node, whatever it is. First, I want to capture the structure. Each node here is a sub-matrix. Select sub-matrix. Two nodes are connected if they overlap. I pick this sub-matrix and that sub-matrix. They overlap. So we connect them here to say that those nodes are not independent. They have to reach a consensus on something. And then I would say each node has a positive semi-definiteness constraint, some equality constraint or inequality constraint. I could have put it here. Each node has local constraint. So each node has local constraint, has overlapping constraint, saying that two sub-matrices might overlap. And the objective of the original problem is a summation of local objective. It turns out that every linear program, every quadratic program, every SDP can be written in this form. I can look at it as a canonical form. If the problem is dense, I have just one node, and that's this. If the problem is sparse, I have so many nodes. So why do we care about this? There are new papers on this. One paper by Stephen Boyd is very nice. Another paper that started this idea was by Don Goldfarb in OR of Columbia University. Basically, what he showed was that if we have just one node, his focus was just one node. And he said, don't use gradient algorithm. Don't use like Newton's algorithm. If you want to solve SDP, take a number of iterations. At each iteration, just do eigenvalue decomposition. So eigenvalue decomposition. I do iteration. I look at the matrix. If the matrix is not positive definite, I remove negative eigenvalues. That's all we do. And he showed that this idea works. This converges to a solution of SDP. And there are papers by his group, Don, Gold, Don Goldfarb group, Stephen Boyle, Levin Van Der Bee. But not in the context of what I mentioned, that there are submatrices like this. We do the trivets. But now the question is, OK, how can I use those ideas? Or maybe combine it with new ideas. We came up with a strategy which is like this. At each node, we do computation. But computation has a closed form solution, just eigenvalue decomposition. So if I go here, if this is one node, this is another node, at this node, I do eigenvalue decomposition on matrix of this size, eigenvalue decomposition on matrix of that size, I communicate to my neighbor. That's all I do, nothing else. And it turns out that it's going to converge. If I have two nodes, these are the iterations that they need to take. It's very quick. So if I'm talking about energy, for example, the size of matrix could be millions of rows, millions of columns. If the tree of S is 27, that means that each node I have to do the eigenvalue decomposition of sub-matrix or 27 by 27. That's how I break down the complexity. And for example, we tried it on problems where without decomposition, it has 14 billion variables. After using like trivest decomposition, removing redundant variables, matrix completion, it's 6 million. It still is a big problem. We wrote the code in C++ and then did an implementation on Amazon server with 36 cores. Depending on how many constraints we have, thousands of constraints for our problem, we can solve a problem in 2 minutes or 20 minutes or two, or Eight minutes in laptop, it takes longer. We did the corresponding calculation in like Mosaic, the state of the art, it's more than two years. So it makes a big difference. It really makes a big difference in terms of the number of iteration. And another thing I should mention that the number of iteration is a lot. It's not like 10 iteration like Newton's method, but each iteration is fast. Mark one microsecond. Iterations are fast, you take more iteration, eventually it pays off. I ignore this. 
Then I spent just a few minutes, two minutes on distributed control, then I wrap up. I didn't talk about distributed discrete optimization. Discrete optimization by itself is really nice. Oh, sorry, this is too long for here. Okay, let me just spend two minutes and talk about the value of this for control people. Distributed control is like this. I have an interconnected system. There are many ways to formulate or state it. One way of formulation is this. I have a bunch of systems, they're interconnected. I want to design a controller with some underlying sparsity that is either given or there's soft penalty on this. And then when I apply the controller to the system, I have to minimize some objective, like H1, H infinity, L1, any combination, whatever we want. And we have a system with disturbance, with noise, it turns out that, okay, this is hard in the worst case. There are lots of nice ideas, like quadratic invariance was one of the ideas that really caught my eyes. It's really nice. But I'm very interested in cases where we don't, you cannot use those ideas. Like power is one example where the problem is so structured that you would say structure is good, but a structure in a negative way. We cannot use the existing sufficient condition. So I would say, what if I use STP? It turns out that if I like Lyapunov equation, use SDP and the Lyapunov equation, the rank of W being 1 means I found the true solution. Whenever it's not 1, it's guaranteed that it's either 2 or 3. So the rank of this is independent of the size, independent of the number of input, output, just because of having a Markov chain property. If you can map it back to a graph, a sparsity graph, the rank is really sparse. That's for the case where the topology is given. Whenever the topology is not given, you use Elliott von Bragg organization, like Mihailo at Minnesota proposed something like this, or other people also work. And we showed that for this non convex problem, by, by changing this lambda under generic condition, the cardinality of k always reduces by 1. So, one thing that we showed was that whenever the topology is fixed, you use STP. Whenever it's not fixed, you want to penalize it, make it like lasso type algorithm, this is non convex. When lambda goes from 0 to infinity, the cardinality of k reduces by 1. So depending on how much sparsity you want to get, you're not going to miss any sparsity, but this is non-convex. To want to solve it, use STP, the rank is upper bounded by 3 again. So to summarize, we talk about optimization. People like Stephen Boyd might argue that optimization is everything, because depending on how you look at it, you can convert your problem to optimization, and then optimization it's mostly about polynomial optimization, even if it's infinite dimensional, you can approximate it. But that's just about quadratic equations. Because linear equations are easy, quadratic equations are bottlenecks. Finding A is easy, B is really hard, but C is the trade-off. How can I find C? And then we said OS and Trivers, we would say sparsity is great. They love sparsity. But I get low rank, then I diagnose non-convexity, penalize it, get rank one. Maybe I have a finite number of STPs that talks about the computational convexity, there's a low com complexity algorithm for sparse STPs. I didn't talk about discrete variables and also model reduction, but this is a new mathematical framework which is orthogonal to like method of moments or sum of squares, which was inspired by problem in energy domain and we tried it on many, many real world systems with like 14,000 variables, real data, real variables. And we're now excited to participate in our project if that competition flies. They started this, they put some information on the website. If you're interested, please take a look. Thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to take your question. <laughs>